co-authored by my advisor, Doug Causey, who's a professor at UAA, and I'm going to be telling you about the effects of classical marine debris on Bering Sea seabirds. Now, I'm really accustomed to going into classrooms and talking about this, so I often encourage kids to like raise their hands and ask questions as we go along. Um, I'm not anticipating that from you guys, so if I feel like, you know, um, if there's something that is it quite gelling in terms of this, the scientific information I'm presenting. Um, we can all sort of revisit it at the end. There are a couple of chemistry type things that, um, you know, if, if I'm not explaining it properly, please let me know and we can get back to it at the end. So first of all, big thank you to Prince William Sound Science Center and Audubon for inviting me out here. Um, I like having a reason to get out of Anchorage, and this was an excellent reason. Um, I love sharing the things that I do research on with other folks. Okay, so the first big question about plastic marine debris is how does it get to the ocean? Um, I think, and I've been having conversations with people over the course of my time being here, and just sort of over the course of the past couple of years, in terms of thinking about how much plastic we use in our everyday life. Uh, when I walk into a classroom and ask kids to point out plastic things, they're basically pointing at everything in the classroom. Because plastic is a very pervasive material in our lives. Some of it is reusable. Um, if we think about, you know, PVC pipes that water goes through, some of it is not. Think of plastic utensils and straws. Those things we throw away. And often, the things that we throw away can take a path to the ocean. So I recently kind of created this diagram to think about the cycle that plastic debris has to go through in order to get to the ocean. And I used, so I used the Nautilus. I don't know if you guys can see the shape of the Nautilus. I thought it was rather <laughs> fitting to use some sort of sea creature to think about this cycle. Um, you know, it starts with the oil and gas industry because plastic is all petroleum-based products. It gets turned into things that we use, so, you know, plastic bags, utensils, bottles, we throw them away. Hopefully in some cases we recycle these items, but um, especially in Alaska, recycling programs that are good and beneficial are sort of hard to come by. I mean, even in Anchorage, we can only recycle number one and number two plastic when there are seven kinds. So that's a hard thing to do as well. And when we throw them away, if that garbage gets taken to the dump, often those landfills aren't necessarily protected in a way to keep litter from getting into you know, the environment or on the street. I often use these pictures of storm drains on the street to think about litter that gets just washed down the storm drain. And in Anchorage, those sewer systems are directly connected to our creek systems. And those creeks, you know, they'll take the litter right out to Cook Inlet, right out into the ocean. Where Animals can get tangled up in it, animals can mistake that stuff for food, um, and it just collects in the ocean. So at last count, the estimate is that about 8 million tons of plastic gets into the ocean every year. Um, 8 million tons is a lot, and that is every year. And the thing that I often point out about this is that plastic is a man-made item. It is not natural, it does not biodegrade. Therefore, it's not gonna break down into you know, its component parts that can then be used by the environment again. It's not something that you put in your compost heap. I don't care what they say, plastic does not biodegrade. Um, some people want to convince you that it like, takes 500 years. No, not true. Instead, what's happening is that it's eroding, it's breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, often by the action of waves in the ocean. And so it gets turned into what we call microplastics. And often microplastics are things that we could potentially see with our naked eye, but it can get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces such that you couldn't see it with the naked eye. There's research out there showing that like, plankton are ingesting small pieces of plastic. So if you think about how tiny plankton are, the pieces of plastic that are going into the plankton are even smaller. So it can get really tiny. And all of that stuff is collecting in the ocean. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that giant island of garbage in the middle of the North Pacific that we lovingly call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is where a lot of our marine debris is collecting. So if you look at the map, 
the garbage patch is located in that convergence zone. And if you look at the way the currents move in the North Pacific, it's kind of easy to, to sort of visualize why the garbage is getting stuck in the middle there. These currents move in a really big circle, and as they're moving along the coasts of the different continents, they're picking up that debris that's coming from the land. And that, that circular motion is creating this sort of whirlpool effect. So everything's getting stuck in that convergence zone, creating this giant patch of garbage. The problem is that it doesn't always stay there. If you see that North Pacific current shooting off north, it's heading towards Alaska, towards the Gulf of Alaska. And often that current will pick up garbage from the patch and bring it our way. And Alaska is unique in a lot of ways, obviously. <laughs> But one of the big things is that it has the longest amount of coastline of any state in the country. And a lot of that coastline is in remote areas where people don't live. And so there are a lot of beaches that we can't see in Alaska that are getting impacted quite a bit by the marine debris that is brought up from that North Pacific current. On top of which, there are people who live in Alaska who are also littering on the land. So you're getting hit from both sides. Um, I was recently having a conversation about Middleton Island, which is sort of western Prince William Sound, and I helped a friend do field work there for two weeks. And this was back in 2010, and it was covered every inch of shoreline. It's not a very big island, but the whole way around, it was covered in garbage. We were catching stickleback out of the lakes. And we didn't bring buckets with us. We just kind of turn around and grab a bucket off the beach because they're the work. And um, that's just one of those sort of like big, crazy examples of what's happening to our marine environment and our shorelines in Alaska. So who loses? Mostly the animals that live in the marine environment. They take a big hit. And two of the main things that happen to animals living in the marine environment when they encounter debris is that they either get tangled up in it or they mistake it for food and ingest it. So um, this infographic, I, I really like this infographic. Um, it, it has a lot going on. Um, the big thing I want you to see is that there are a lot of sad animal faces because they're wrapped up in debris. And this is true not just of North Pacific animals, but um, marine animals all over, the, all over the globe. Fishing line is a big problem. Um, I feel like in Cordova, I don't have to ask if you've ever gone fishing. You probably go fishing all the time this summer. It's really strong stuff, right? It's hard to break. And animals, you know, when they encounter this fishing line, they'll often get wrapped up in it. And they don't have fingers or thumbs to get this stuff off them. They often struggle against it to the point where it wraps so tightly around them that it's going to cut them. Now, what I tell kids, and I, I feel bad sometimes because I think I make them really sad and upset, but it's a real problem. Um, if you're an animal in the middle of nowhere and you get cut, you can't take care of that cut, it's going to get infected. There's no doctor to give you antibiotics or neosporin. That infection is going to make that animal very sick. Um, the other example I give is nets. So nets or shrimp pots or any sort of thing like that that fishermen use. When fishermen are out doing their job, they have to tend the net. They have to get it out of the water, grab any animal that's gotten caught, put it back in the water. But sometimes fishermen lose those nets. And so what happens is that that net is still doing its job. It's still catching things. So if you are a marine mammal that needs to get to the surface of the ocean to breathe, and you get stuck in one of those nets and can't make it to the surface, you're going to drown. Um, so brace yourself, these pictures are a little sad. But when you do a Google search of animals stuck in debris, you come up with lots and lots and lots So if you could put yourself in the place of that stingray, which has no fingers or hands or anything, and it's stuck in that giant net, like how are you going to get out of it? They don't have any mechanisms really to get out of it. 
And so, you know, what becomes of it? What becomes of these animals that are tangled up in this stuff? Okay, so that's entanglement. Ingestion is a whole other story. And sort of the poster child for plastic ingestion is this guy. These are albatross. Um, if you go out sort of to the more open waters in Alaska, you often see albatross hanging out. But they breed in Hawaii. And so they build their nests along all these different islands. Um, if you guys are familiar with Midway Island, um, it's all the way up there. But that is a giant albatross breeding colony. And they're going to build their nests here. And when they're looking for food, when they go out to forage, they often go north of those islands. And so if you look at this sort of little area right here, just north of Hawaii is exactly where that garbage patch is. And so these birds are looking for food in this giant patch of garbage. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack when it comes to looking for real food items. Often, they will pick up pieces of plastic and believe it to be food. Um, good examples are plastic bags, bottle caps, cigarette lighters. It's not like they saw this giant patch of garbage and said, like, hey, that looks really tasty. No, this is what they've always been doing. They've always been foraging in this area, and now it's covered in trash. So plastic bags are a real killer. Um, and it's because they look like sea jellies. To us, we know the difference between a plastic bag and a sea jelly. To an albatross or a turtle, they don't see it. They didn't invent plastic bags. They didn't make plastic. So for them, they think it's the same thing. I've actually, so if anybody's familiar with Jeff Corwin, he's like on Animal Planet and he does really cool videos. He was at a turtle rehab center and they had rescued this turtle who couldn't die. He was a sea turtle, sea turtles have to die to get to their food. And this thing was too buoyant. He actually couldn't get under the water. And it's because he had swallowed a plastic bag that created an air bubble inside of his stomach. And that air bubble made him so buoyant that he couldn't get under the water. Um, and luckily, you know, that turtle got the plastic bag extracted. My uh, sort of pessimistic thought was, are you just going to release him into the wild to eat another plastic bag? But um, it's just a good example of what's happening to these animals. So the albatross adults aren't just looking for food for themselves. They're looking for food for their chicks. A couple of things, I mean, <laughs> I guess I don't have to tell the Audubon Society that birds don't have teeth. I'm sure you guys know that. Um, but these birds are bringing this food to these chicks, or what they think is food, it's actually plastic, to these chicks. And the chicks are swallowing these things whole because they don't have teeth. They're not chewing it and breaking it down. I said earlier that plastic doesn't biodegrade. So when that plastic gets into the stomach, your stomach acids, which are meant to break down tissue, aren't going to break down the plastic. And so what happens is, you know, your stomach's like a pouch. It's only got a certain amount of volume. And what happens for these baby birds is that that volume gets filled with plastic. It doesn't break down. Therefore, they can't poop it out. It's not going to come out the other end. Their intestine won't, it won't fit through their intestine. And they can't get any real nutrition. Sad but true. And so what happens to a chick that's just eating plastic? It starves to death. So I don't have it here. I would recommend to anybody Go watch it's a four minute film of Midway film. It's heartbreaking, um, but it really captures um, the plight of the albatross on these islands. It's really quite sad. Okay, how big is this problem? Is it just the albatross? Is it just some turtles? Not quite. Um, Every seabird on Earth is eating plastic. There was a paper that came out recently that projected that by like 
2050, every bird would be eating plastic. Um, it could be long before 2050 um, because marine debris is so pervasive in the environment. Are we sad yet? It's pretty sad. It's not a happy topic. I apologize. Um, I kind of wanted to give you that background so that I can launch into what we do um, with our research. So our big question is, are seabird populations in the western Aleutian Islands, and sort of the very few overall, impacted by marine debris? So most of our work happens in the far west islands, which they actually call the near islands, because they're closest to Russia. Um, but Atu, Atu, Skiali, Oldir, Kiska, everything sort of west of Adak is where we've been focusing our work. Although we're, um, we recently got samples from on Alaska to ADAC also, so we can now broaden our geographic range. And those islands are part of the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. And the reason we do our work here is because the refuge harbors the largest proportion of breeding seabirds in North America. These islands are really productive. These birds really love to be there and have their babies there. So things like auklets, Cormies, tree waters, puffins. Actually, that's from St. Paul. I took that picture this year, and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> their feet are so orange. I love their feet. Pigeon guillemots. That's a thick filled myrrh, but common myrrh also. Um, and of course, there's a whole slew of breeding seabirds that I didn't include. I just kind of wanted to show off some of the great pictures that people collected over the course of the summer. It, they're not all mine. Um, <laughs> I'm going to brag for a friend. He, his name's Jeff. He was out collecting birds for us this summer, and he's an amazing photographer. So I was like, I need to use your pictures in my presentation. So showing them all off for him. Here's the thing about the birds that breed in the refuge. Over the past few decades, their populations have been declining. And people aren't really sure why. And so as scientists, we kind of have this task of figuring out the underlying mechanisms for these declines. So there are also <laughs> other studies ongoing with the birds that we look at, like um, food web ecology studies. Are the birds eating something different than what they used to? Is it less nutritious? Something like that. But for me, um, I'm really interested in the contaminant side. And so I'm focusing on whether or not those chemicals from the plastics that they are likely ingesting are impacting their health. Okay, so what do we do? So we head out to the Aleutians every year, collect samples, and we have to bring these samples home to be dissected. And when we're dissecting them, we're gonna look in their stomachs first to see if there's actually any plastic in their stomach at the time we collected them. And so, um, it's actually, an, it's a great tool for us because um, basically all you have to do is take the inside of the stomach and empty it into water and look to see what floats. That's all it takes to look for plastic in stomach contents. And so I've been actually using it as a teaching tool over the last couple of years with kids. Um, tell them to put their gloves on, open up the stomach, empty that stuff into the water and see what happens. Um, no chemicals, few moving parts, no real sharp objects, it's great. How old room. is the girl in your picture there? She is, I'm going to say she's like, she was second or third grade. That's awesome. When I, um, she's from St. Paul. Mm -hmm. These are the kids that came out with Tanya for AMSS. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember her, her name. Right. Um, yeah, she was like second or third grade. I've had, you know, that grade up to high schoolers doing this sort of work for me. <laughs> They're my little slaves. <laughs> Um, so sometimes we find really obvious pieces of plastic in their stomach, like this. This came from a common myrrh that we collected in 2013. And one of the things that comes to light about these birds ingesting this plastic is that it's actually, there's physical harm that can be incurred. So that slice, that little laceration next to the piece of plastic wasn't caused by us. I didn't do that with my scalpel. That happened from the piece of plastic. So. 
these plastics can cause some really physical, some real physical harm to the birds. But often it's not like that. Often it's these small little pieces of plastic, those microplastics that we're finding inside our birds. So it's very different from those albatross. Those albatross are starving to death because they have so much plastic in their stomach that they can't get real food. Our birds aren't necessarily, like there's no evidence of birds starving to death with plastic, you know, just filling up their stomach. Because this is what we're finding in there. When you have things that are only five millimeters across, there's a good chance that that's going to get passed through their intestine without any problem. So this is what we find in our birds. The question becomes, what does that do to them? Well, plastics are covered in lots and lots of chemicals. And when those plastics are inside the bird's stomach, those chemicals can leach off and get into their body, kind of get incorporated into other tissues in their body. And is that sort of something that is harming their health? That's the big question for me. So we do these chemical analyses. Um, luckily, there is a lab literally next door to us, across the hallway, who do these analyses for us. And we've been working with them for the past few years to really get this information off the ground, build up our data set. And what we're looking for is this group of chemicals called phthalates. They're our target chemicals. So phthalates are esters of phthalic acid. They're additive chemicals in plastics. In other words, they're plasticizers. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. That are not bound to the polymer matrix and are susceptible to leaching. So here's sort of the generic uh, chemical structure for phthalates. When you have plastic, say, so just imagine you have you know, your standard water bottle that is disposable. You turn it over and there's a triangle on the bottom, correct? And inside the triangle is a number. So there's one through seven, and those identify the type of plastic polymer that you are holding in your hand. So often, um, one of those disposable plastic bottles is a number one. Am I correct? One? Yeah. Which is PET, polyethylene. So polyethylene is the molecule that makes up that plastic matrix. Those chemicals, those molecules come together and they form a matrix. So they're all sort of interconnected. And that is what is making your material. On its own, often those plastics aren't doing the job that manufacturers want that plastic to do. And so you have to add extra chemicals to the plastic to give it things like flexibility or clarity or strength. And that's where phthalates come in. These chemicals get coated on the plastic and they will add these particular properties to them. Because they are on top of the plastic and not part of the polymer matrix, that makes them very susceptible to coming off of the plastic. To the point where, you know, these chemicals can actually get aerosolized. They can just pop off whatever plastic material you have and get into the air. You rub them and it gets on your hands. You have food that's in a plastic container and those chemicals could potentially leach into your food. So, they're kind of everywhere. They're very pervasive in the environment. I'm going to tell you why we care about that in a second. Um, they're also used in things that, like, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, when I first started my research, I wouldn't necessarily think that soap has phthalates in it. But soap often has phthalates in it. The reason why is because those chemicals act as an emulsifier. It sort of gives those materials, like soap or, you know, facial washes or anything like that, um, that gelatinous quality. And sort of, Moving away from phthalates for 10 seconds and, and talking about facial washes, microbeads, microbeads are like the worst thing ever. Um, they're little plastic balls that you use to wash your face and then you wash it down the drain. Um, and those things stay in the environment forever. There are a lot of states that are working towards um, banning microbeads in all these different personal care products. I think California was the most recent one that banned it, but places like New York and Illinois I think have. And a lot of the big companies like Neutrogena and Johnson & Johnson are working towards phasing out microbeads altogether in their products. Um, 
toothpaste, if you have the toothpaste that has the little balls in it, those little balls are made of plastic. So try and get the toothpaste without the little balls. <laughs> um, other places where it's used, like medical equipment, is often coated in um, a particular phthalate called DEHP. And so that chemical was leaching off into whatever medication was like in the IV bag. You stick that IV, you know, in your patient, and it's, they're not just getting the medicine, they're getting that chemical. Um, I believe that the medical industry is moving away from using phthalates. I was at um, a wilderness first aid course two summers ago, and I picked up the saline bag, and it specifically said DEHP free. So I'm hoping that that's kind of across the board for medical equipment, but I'm not quite sure. It's hard to keep up. This, this research is always sort of getting updated, so it's hard to keep up with the most recent research, but every like month or so, I'll go on to Web of Science and see what's out there. Okay, so now, here's to why we care. Phthalates are endocrine disrupting compounds. So basically, when they get into your body, they mess with your endocrine system. Your endocrine system is responsible for the production of hormones. Your hormones are very important chemicals in your body because they help you function day to day. They help you reproduce. They help you grow. They are very vital to your existence. They are very vital to all living organisms' existence. And when these chemicals from the outside get into our body, our body will get confused and often use these chemicals as hormones instead of the real thing. It happens because, sort of, in the grand scheme, the basic structure of these phthalates often looks a lot like things like testosterone or estrogen. So your hormone receptors, like I said, they're responsible for a lot of things that make you function. Your cell processes, releasing those chemicals, sending those signals, growing, protein synthesis. And when you have disruptors, they come in and just mess with the whole system. Oops, sorry. Hit too many buttons. There we go. So what can it do to us? We're complicated as human beings. We get exposed to a lot of things. And so direct associations between um, exposure to phthalates and our health consequences are a little complicated to tease out. But some of the things that are emerging in terms of what kinds of effects phthalates can have on people um, are right here. So for females, it can really impact our reproductive systems. Um, it can also play a role in cancer risk. Guys don't have it easy. One of the biggest ones is that a lot of these chemicals are estrogen mimics. They are feminizing compounds. Try walking into a high school classroom and telling boys that they're getting exposed to feminizing compounds. <laughs> it is a very interesting experience. Um, <laughs> you just kind of have to like, their faces just kind of go like, what? Um, it's very fun and you often get their attention at that point. Because boys don't want to be, you know, they're boys. They don't necessarily want to be girls. Not that I'm judging. Um, but this is a thing that happens with these chemicals. They have these feminizing effects. On top of which, they are associated with higher rates of infertility in men. Exposure to these chemicals can really do a number on your sperm. It's, it's been shown in quite a few research studies that that's what's happening. So that's why these chemicals are really scary. And I think one of the biggest and scariest things in terms of thinking about, you know, pregnant women or pregnant animals, whatever, um, hormones play a big role in sexual differentiation during embryonic development. If you have chemicals from the outside that are acting like hormones during that process, what does it do in the long term? 
How does it impact health that way? Okay, so um, I'm going to bring it back around to the birds I study. And the big question for me is, are these birds getting exposed to these chemicals? The answer is yes, they are. So I'm going to sort of navigate this slide a little bit for you. When we dissect our birds, we take a piece of muscle tissue. We make sure that it hasn't been exposed to plastic. We don't want any cross-contamination. And we take that piece of muscle tissue to the lab, and we ask them to look for concentrations of particular phthalates. So there are 25 kinds of phthalates overall. The lab can look for six. So DMP, DEP, BBP, DNOP, DBP, and DEHP. And these were chosen because they're sort of the most commonly used in the US. DEHP being that one that's used in medical equipment quite a bit. And so overall, we've looked at muscle tissue from 42 adult birds, ranging all species that we've been collecting so far. And every bird that we have looked at has had some level of some phthalate in their tissue. Perhaps not all six, definitely not all six, not all six because none of them had um, the DNOP in their muscle tissue, but at least one of them, every bird. Often, they had just detectable levels of one type, and then other, other types were below the level of detection. So that's what um, below LOD means. So often, you know, these numbers kind of indicate that of 42 birds, 31 of them didn't have detectable levels of the DEHP in them. But every single bird had some type in it. The other thing to sort of note is that we looked at the stomach contents of all of these birds. And some of them had plastic in their stomach at the time that we had collected them, but others didn't. And so the other thing about these chemical analyses, it can give us this look back in time to see whether or not that bird had either eaten plastic at some point in its life, or um, more likely it probably ate a fish or ate some plankton that had eaten plastic. So it's getting the, um, getting the chemical exposure that way also. So we often collect our birds um, late May, early June, and it's just prior to breeding season for these birds. When you're out in the water, you cannot tell if a seabird, or we cannot tell if a seabird is a male or a female, nor can we tell if a female bird has an egg in it. Um, or, in other words, if it's gravid. But some of the birds that we collected were gravid. They had these developed embryos inside of them. They hadn't yet laid those eggs. And so we dissected those embryos out and looked for phthalates in those. Lo and behold, those embryos all had phthalates in them. So again, I'll navigate this for you for a little bit. Um, on the x-axis, so every adult female that had an embryo in it we looked at the muscle tissue from the adult, and we looked at the embryo. So adult like tissue, embryonic tissue on the Y. And it's a small sample size, it's only about 11. And what we found was that often the DHP ended up in higher levels than the rest of the congeners in um, these embryos. But the really crazy thing, so DHP, that is just sort of a suggested line I definitely need more data points to actually look for trends. But the crazy thing was this one. So I pointed out on the other slide that we didn't find DNOP in any of our adults, but two of the embryos have detectable levels of DNOP, which raises the question for us, what is this particular chemical, that DNOP, doing inside the adult body that makes it show up in the embryo but not in the adult? Is it that the female bird is just sequestering all of those chemicals right into the egg? We're not sure. Um, this is sort of the beginning of what we're doing. It kind of opens a can of worms for us in terms of the research and asking these broader questions. But it really does raise this question of, you know, are these embryos just dumping sites for these chemicals in the bird? And that further raises the question of what happens to the chick? So how will in utero phthalate exposure impact the seabird chicks? I don't have an answer, hypothetical question. Um, 
There's only one study out that experimented with chicken eggs by dosing the eggs with um, varying levels of DEHP, so just one conjurer. They were dosing the birds at levels that were parts per million. And so they started, you know, they had their control with zero, no DEHP, and they started at five and they worked up to 100. They also did one comparison of DBP at 100 parts per million. They incubated the eggs to hatching. So the first thing that happens is that the hatching rate goes way down for any birds that were dosed. That's a big thing. The second thing is that any birds that hatched from 20 and above were born with some serious birth defects. So I'm sorry that this is happening after dinner <laughs> because this picture is not pretty. Um, those birth defects were things called gastroschisis and omphalocele. I hope I'm saying that right. But basically what happened is that the birds were born with their insides out. So in the last few days of development, you have this sort of seam going down the center, and the tissue they're gonna, gonna kind of grow over the rib cage and towards the sternum and seal up. And that holds everything inside. That didn't happen for these birds. They were born with their insides out. I think this is something that could happen in human babies, but human babies have doctors. Seabird chicks do not have doctors. If this happens to a seabird chick, it's gonna be someone's lunch. Um, I don't know whether or not this is happening to our birds. We haven't spend, spent enough time in the field to make those sorts of observations. I'd be very interested to see. But one thing I'd like to point out is that they were dosing these birds at parts per million, and the levels that we're finding in our birds are parts per billion. So it's, it's a grade lower. Like it's lower than parts per million for sure. Um, the, other, the other thing to you know, sort of contrast is that this is just one congener, and often our birds have more than one congener um, of exposure. So is that, is that making an impact somehow also that sort of multiple congener exposure versus like super high levels of just one? These are all, you know, questions that <laughs> surround my research that I don't have an answer to yet, but perhaps one day could have an answer to. So the other question that rises from finding phthalates in embryos is this. There are people in Alaska who harvest seabird eggs. Are they eating eggs that have phthalates in them? I don't know. Are they getting exposed to these chemicals through their subsistence lifestyle? Um, I was able to collect parts of six mer eggs from St. Paul this summer. I haven't, uh, haven't been able to test them for phthalates yet, but I'd like to. I'm really curious. Um, I've given this presentation in a couple of places where people go duck hunting, and I've asked them to potentially save parts of eggs for me so that I could see what's happening. Um, but this raises a lot of questions in terms of environmental health and human health, and how the environment impacts human health, for sure. It also, for me, kind of brings everything full circle. What we do, the choices we make, right now, in terms of the waste we create and the materials we use, can somehow come around and impact us in a way that we could never see. It's not like these people can look at the eggs and say, like, that's full of phthalates, I'm never gonna eat it. You don't know, these chemicals are, you know, not, like, it's not something that you can see with the naked eye. Um, but it is coming around to impact us in a way that we can't necessarily see or know the long-term impacts of. Okay, so what's next? A lot of things are next. <laughs> um, definitely need to build up this database of phthalate exposure, build that foundation of knowledge. To what extent are these birds getting exposed? What's the geographic range of this exposure? Now that we have um, specimens from sort of the Eastern Aleutians, we could actually really broaden that geographic range and perhaps compare, you know, are birds that live closer to human impacted areas going to have higher levels of phthalates in them versus you know those birds all the way out on Atu doesn't make a difference. Maybe it doesn't even make a difference. Um, 
We'd like to start measuring organic pollutants in the tissues from the same birds because research is showing that when plastic is in the environment, it acts like a sponge and it'll absorb organic pollutants in it. And so when a bird swallows a piece of plastic, it's not just those phthalates that it's necessarily getting exposed to, it could be PCBs or PAHs, things like that, that have been shown, you know, like the proof is out there, these are carcinogenic compounds. Um, definitely build up these long-term field studies and um, hopefully continue egg harvest monitoring. I got six eggs this summer, so hopefully next summer I can get a few more eggs as well and keep on working on that. And then finally, things like this. Telling other folks about what we do and continuing this outreach and education. That's a really important component for me. Um, I started this work and suddenly realized that I couldn't just keep it to myself. I needed to start telling people about it. Um, and whether it was the scientific community or the non-scientific community, whether it's a group of third graders like I talked to today, or it's you guys, like, I think it's really important that people learn that these are the impacts marine debris can have on the environment. Show you a few pictures of my kids, because I'm really proud of them. These are the kids in Unalaska doing their cleanup. It was super fun. Some boys helping out on St. Paul, Chauncey and Ethan. Uh, they actually helped us catch birds. They are awesome. They were super fun to hang with. And then this is my high school student, Rachel, who just went off to college. I'm super proud of her. But um, she's been a big help in a lab for the past couple of years. And I really love having these kids around to, you know, inspire them to be scientists. <coughs> Um, the other question becomes, what can we do to help? Often, you know, the thing I say is these personal choices, these little choices you can make to reduce the amount of waste you create, everything's going to have an impact. You know, not using straws, um, not using plastic utensils, all sorts of things like that. They'll make a difference in the long run. So with that, I thank you, and I'm going to leave up the slide with my contact info. But thanks for being awesome. So Veronica, I was trying to remember, you know the book Our Stolen Future. I was just which, talking about that with Anne. Which, <laughs> which brought up this whole thing of um, the mimics, the horror mm -hmm. the endocrine mimics. Well, were they talking about families there? I was trying to remember what I don't they think are. they were. I think they were talking about a couple of other things. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But I think it was prior to when phthalates were so becoming an issue. In other words, there's lots of hormone. There are natural, there are natural endocrine disruptors too. Soy, soy has estrogen mimics in it. So like, men shouldn't like overdose on soy. That's you know a, something that's known. But yeah, there are um, there are other endocrine disruptors besides the phthalates for sure that we have to be careful of. It's just that these are like super pervasive. Like, I mean, there's used everywhere, and so it becomes a problem because of how pervasive they are. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm curious to know if there's other groups looking at phthalates in other parts of the food web, marine mammals, plankton? They're working on it. Okay. Um, yeah, they are. They're certainly working on it. I'm not sure of any, like, I'm sure there's stuff outside of seabirds. I know that there's right. a group in Australia doing seabirds, and there's a group in Norway doing seabirds with phthalates, right. but um, there are definitely other groups that are looking at phthalates and other animals. In Alaska, are they doing? I don't know about in Alaska. Okay. We might be the only group in Alaska right now. Right? Okay. I've been reaching out to you know like marine mammal people, trying right. to get Bob up to get some samples mm -hmm. from the seals and things like that. But um, I think right now we're the only group doing that in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Is is anyone doing any, anything similar in, in say California or something when there are more more people and more um, Exposure to compare. Not that I know of. I think so. Okay, I'm gonna take it back because you just triggered my. <laughs> never mind. Um, so, one of my committee members is looking at phthalates in salmon, out of Kodiak. Um, I think they're looking in fish. I don't know about birds. Um, like I said, this research is so, is emerging so quickly that it's a little hard to keep up with it. But I wouldn't be surprised if folks are looking at phthalates and birds in other parts of the U.S. It might not have been published yet, 
also. I mean, that's why I only know of the Australia group and the Norway group, because that work has been published. Mm -hmm. But um, it's starting to become a thing, yeah. for sure. A lot of times, like, people are focusing on the fact that animals are ingesting the plastic versus the chemicals from the plastic, mm -hmm. um, because it's so visceral to see, like, a bird that has starved to death because its stomach is full of plastic. Um, so this is kind of that next step that people are getting to. The analyses are also super expensive. So, um, so each sample that you do a value, how much is it? $160. Mm -hmm. um, will that price come down, you think, or is it just, uh, like I know oil, when you do like oil samples, yeah. it would be like 500 or 600 bucks. I, mean, it's just, I, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. I wish it would. <laughs> but I don't know off the top of my head whether or not that's mm -hmm. gonna happen. Yeah, it's pricey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a super, like, and, and the lab has to be super specialized because you know, even lab equipment is all made of plastic. So you have to kind of revamp your, your lab in order to do a valid analysis. Is this the only lab in, in Alaska? As far as I know, there are industrial labs, like, you know, um, the consulting lab sort of places down in the lower US that um, also do it, especially for food industry and things like, like children's tours often get tested. Um, so, but their, their levels of detection are um, quite higher than ours. So like ours are super fine scale. And um, sorry, I like my button doesn't work to silence my phone. <laughs> and of course it's Doug calling me. Like he knows that I'm here. <laughs> um, and so our levels of detection are like super fine scale, whereas a lot of those industry um, companies, their levels of detection are gonna be a little bit higher. So we might be missing out on what we're doing, so it's nice that we have this connection with a lab that's doing something pretty fine scale. Do you know, <clears throat> I read a book uh, about uh, on toxics or something, but Europe, find, uh, they if there's something that they even think in, in a product that can ha cause humans harm, they reject it. And this has a lot to do with the body washes and and cosmetics and stuff, and you know, they ask where it went, and they said it goes to the U.S. Because they'll accept it. Well, and here's the, here's the other thing, so the medical literature is kind of where I started in terms of doing my background research, and the medical literature goes back to like the late 70s, early 80s, and basically doctors were convinced that we were just peeing it out. Like, they were doing urinalyses, and they were finding it in the urine, and therefore they thought it just goes right through our system. But they didn't kind of look deeper until other people started, like, you know, people started questioning whether or not we're, we're metabolizing these things. So um, that's part of why they're so pervasive is, I, I think, you know, because there's this culture built up around it that it wasn't harmful to us, it was just passing through our system. Um, you and I were talking about this, but I thought it was interesting. Can you just speak to if there are studies been done on like the, the biomagnification in phthalates or you know the PHs and PCBs that are being found in tissues? Right. So um, as far as I understand it, we don't know whether or not the bioaccumulation is happening. So um, if I'm using the term bioaccumulation, like I have to, we know what that means, right? Like I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be patronizing. I just want to make sure that we're all the same too. Okay. Um, so you know, you have a tiny animal like a plankton that has chemicals in it and a bigger animal like a fish is going to eat lots and lots and lots of those plankton and so it's getting doses over and over of a certain chemical which builds up in its tissue and then you have something like a bird that's going to eat multiple fish and so it's going to get more doses of that chemical and so it's going to accumulate as you move up the food chain and so the animals that are top predators are going to have the highest doses and highest concentrations of a particular contaminant because they're eating everything else that's collected it along the way up. Um, that's why, like tuna and dolphin, when it comes to mercury, um, they're a big problem because they're top of the food chain, and so they bioaccumulate a ton of mercury. Um, we haven't figured out whether or not phthalates are bioaccumulating in the food web. Um, that's part of that's one of my goals to compare seabirds that are eating at different trophic levels, so like the plankton eating birds versus the offshore fish eating birds versus the near shore fish eating birds to see if the levels are statistically different. So, you know, if it is bioaccumulating, the plankton eaters would have less than the fish eaters and things like that. 
but I'm not there yet with my data set and I haven't seen anything yet to say whether or not it is accumulating. Mm -hmm. It could be that the chemicals are so metabolically active that they're not accumulating, they're getting used. Um, I know that, that uh, a, a guy who came up to work for it and, and worked in the fisheries and he said that he won't eat the belly of salmon because mm -hmm. there's so much fat in it and that's where all the toxic. Right, yeah, because fat, like you have a lot of hormones stored in your fat, right? And so, yeah, and a lot of toxins go in. But like the toxins end up in muscle tissue also. Oh, I But like hormone mm -hmm. disrupting compounds will often end up in the fat because, you know, that's where we store a lot of our, um, a lot of those hormones. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to look at a lot of fish stomachs and see what they're eating. I'm really curious. It's my goal. I'd like to see fish stomachs. How far west did you get? Did you get to Atu to do the sampling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Been to Atu. We're around St. Paul this year too, doing some sampling. But yeah, if we go all the way up. What about foxes? Are they still on Chimian? We're not allowed on Chimian. <laughs> we don't go there. <laughs> because there's like a super secret base over there. Oh. <laughs> it's a bee and a ballistic missile bird on the inside. Plus, I don't know. Yeah, we don't go there. I call it an alien landing pad, but you know, it's just me. If, um, if they do find uh, that there was a lot of bioaccumulation, does that, that probably mean it's sort of everything? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. What's in all of us right now, for if sure. If they find out if it is, will there be any long term solution? So there are. I like that question. Um, there are, actually. There are people working on green phthalates, so basically like more organic and eco-friendly chemicals that can be used as plasticizers. But there are also people working on like bioplastics. Um, so there's a group working on chitin, so the things that make shrimp shells, and turning that into a usable, durable plastic. I think algae is another one. And then fungus, mushrooms. Um, and turning those sorts of materials into durable materials that we can use for the long term. That, you know, eventually will actually biodegrade and not harm the environment. So people are working on it. Um, just maybe, like, <laughs> gonna get a move on. <laughs> move a little faster. But um, yes, there are people. And there's also, so there's a kid, he's like a teenager, and um, he paired up with these engineers to make um, a contraption that helps sort of collect some of the marine debris out of the ocean. It's called the Ocean Cleanup. Look it up, it's super cool. And he's like, this team from, is it Denmark? I think it's from one of the Scandinavian countries. But he was just like, let's clean up the ocean. And he did something about it. He's like working on it. It was super cool. It's, you know, I don't know if it's actually gonna work, but it's cool that this kid is trying and making an effort. So that was pretty awesome. Baltimore Harbor has a <laughs> trash cleanup that this little boat that goes around, well, big boat that goes around the harbor and it has arms that can move around mm -hmm. and yep. it's got a, like a chain mail mm -hmm. uh, tractor and it goes and hits this uh, um, conveyor belt that yep. picks up and dumps it into a, a, a thing and then it goes over to shore, backs up and dumps it all into a truck. Yep. And then for the little pieces, they have a guy who goes around in like a kayak and picks up things that it can't get close enough to. They're working hard at that. Yep, yeah. that's for sure. That's I saw cool. that and I was so happy to see it. It was yeah. awesome. Um, and you know, people in Alaska are really good about shore shoreline cleanups. It's hard because Alaska has so much shoreline, but you know, there are a lot of people out there trying to collect the debris and put it somewhere. I know we sent a whole lot of debris down to like Seattle recently. I don't know if it was from Kodiak, it might have been from Kodiak, but like tons and tons of debris. And it went down for recycling or reuse or whatever it was. Do you do anything with radioactivity like from Fukushima? No, but it's funny that you asked that because um, one of the other projects that I've been sort of um, helping out with is an Aleutian Turn project. And Aleutian Turns, there's like a big breeding colony in Yakutat, and they put geolocators on those birds. And they stop in Fukushima before they head down, like when they migrate for winter, before they head down to like further southern uh, Asian places. But they'll stop in Fukushima. And so um, the person 
who'd been working on this for a long time, was like, I wonder if they're radioactive. And I was like, I think there's a way to look for that stuff, but I've never done it before. But um, there's, you know, that's been a question for some of the birds that I've helped, you know, with, for, for projects on. Mostly those ocean birds, though. So. Mm. They might be getting hit hard, quite honestly. Mm. Well, thank Any you. Other questions? Well, this has really been fascinating. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And, um, I really appreciate you coming. And I hope you can come back in another two years. More data. Further along on things. Yes. Because, I mean, you have posed a lot of really interesting questions. So, mm -hmm. you know, thanks for coming. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah.